Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well done, that's pretty good. It's lovely to see you all this morning. It's my joy to share this morning service with you. My name is Liz, and I'd just like to extend a special welcome to those who are new or visiting today, um, and all those who come all the time. It's good to see you. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, it's great to see you. Okay, before we get started, I thought I would share some words from Psalm 100. And it says this, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures all generations. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day in which we can come together and praise your name, to hear from your word and exhort and encourage one another together. Lord, we settle our hearts and minds and we choose now to set ourselves um, before your throne to, to uh, drink of your word and your truths that we might be transformed into your likeness and image to go out praising your name and representing you and your goodness here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together and worship. <coughs>
seated. So this morning is a communion service and it's a little bit of a different style to the previous communion services, but I'm sure you'll enjoy it. I certainly enjoyed preparing for it. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, we will say this prayer together of preparation. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are known, let us support our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may ever be you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to uh, say the Ten Commandments together and there's a response on each slide. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to speak with You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to speak with the sword. I missed a bit. My apologies. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, for the Lord will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Oh, sorry. For the Lord will not take him, guileless who takes his name in vain. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember that the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour. And do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God, and in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your manservant or maidservant or cattle or sojourner who is within your gates. For six, sorry, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep the sword. Honour your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord gives you. Lord, Lord have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not cover your neighbour's house. You shall not cover your neighbour's wife, or his servant, or his maid, or his ox, or ass, or anything that is his. Lord, have mercy on us, and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Will the children like to come forward for the kids' spot now? So I'll just turn to face you all over here. Yeah. Alrighty, so today we are finishing our time looking at the Apostles' Creed. We've been looking at that for a while, haven't we? We have been looking at the Apostles' Creed to remind ourselves of all of the things that the Bible teaches and that we believe. And this week we are being reminded that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Which means we believe that because Jesus died and rose again, if we believe in him and put our trust in him, 
then even though we die, we will rise too and live with him forever. I've got a story that I'm going to read to you today that teaches us about that and teaches us about the first person who that happened to. The story is called Goodbye to Goodbyes. In the little town of Bethany, there lived a man named Lazarus. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Martha loved to throw a party and Mary loved to sit and listen. Lazarus loved his two sisters and they were all friends with a man named Jesus. But one day Lazarus got sick. He went to bed sick and he woke up sick. Mary and Martha looked after him, but Lazarus got worse and worse. I know, said Martha. I'll tell our friend Jesus and he can come help. Martha thought about all that Jesus had done. He made the blind people see. He made the deaf people hear. He made people who had been sick walk, jump, run and leap for joy. He could make Lazarus well. So she and Mary sent a message to Jesus. Lord Jesus, our brother Lazarus, the friend that you love, is sick. Come quickly. It took two days for Martha's message to reach Jesus. And when Jesus heard that his friend was very, very sick, he did nothing. <clears throat> did nothing? That's right. He didn't ride the first donkey to Bethany. He didn't run until his side hurt. For two whole days, he stayed right where he was. Jesus told his disciples, Our friend Lazarus is very sick, but this illness won't, live, won't end with Lazarus being dead. We won't have to say goodbye forever. I have a plan. Phew, Jesus had a plan. But what was it? Then at last, Jesus and his disciples headed to Bethany. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, Jesus announced. But I'm on my way to wake him up. The disciples looked at each other. Did they hear him right? Lazarus was sleeping? Couldn't Mary and Martha wake him up? Jesus knew their questions. He looked at them and said, Lazarus has died. Dead? How could this be? Didn't Jesus say that Lazarus would not die? Didn't he say that, he wouldn't have, that we wouldn't have to say goodbye forever? What happened to his plan? Every step to Bethany felt heavier and heavier. Their hearts sank deeper and deeper. They were sad that their friend had died. They didn't even get to say goodbye. Four days after Lazarus had died, Jesus and his disciples finally arrived. Martha came running to meet them. Her face was sad and her eyes were red. Lord, she gasped, if only you had been here. Lazarus would not have died. But I know nothing is impossible with you. Even after someone's died and you've said our forever goodbyes. You're right, Martha, Jesus said. There is a day coming when we will say goodbye to say goodbyes forever. Do you believe that? Martha nodded, yes. I believe in you, Jesus. I know that you are the Son of God and I know that you will always do what you promise. You will end all of our goodbyes forever. Martha went and fetched Mary. Mary was so sad. The brother she loved was gone. She would never hug him again. She would never eat with him again. She would never see his face again. Jesus saw her tears and then it happened. His heart broke. He knew what he was about to do. He knew Lazarus' goodbye wasn't forever, but his heart still broke for his friends. When they reached Lazarus' tomb, Jesus cried too. They cried and cried and cried because they'd had to say a forever goodbye. But then Jesus stopped crying and said, Take away the stone. Martha told him that there might be a horrible smell. Jesus said, you need to believe me. And so they took away the stone. Then he yelled like a lion's mighty roar, Lazarus, come out. 
and he did. Jesus had kept his word. Lazarus being sick didn't end with him being dead. It ended, him, it ended with him being alive even after he died, even after they had to say goodbye. Mary and Martha, Lazarus and Jesus were together again. So Mary threw a, Martha threw a party. Mary laughed and listened. Lazarus was glad to be alive. But then the time came for Jesus to say goodbye. He hugged his friends that he loved and said, Goodbye for now, but not forever. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem when he would, where he would be the one to say goodbye and die. And then just like Lazarus, walk out of the tomb alive. And after that, Jesus had to say goodbye again because he was going back to heaven. It was sad for Jesus' friends to say goodbye, but they would see him again in the land that lay after their dying, in the land where there would be no goodbyes, not ever. We all have to say goodbye sometimes. Some of them are short goodbyes, some of them are long. Sometimes a friend of Jesus who we love gets sick and we're sad. Sometimes because they die we have to say goodbye and it feels like a forever goodbye. Jesus knows that it's sad to say goodbye. But Jesus came to end goodbyes. And one day Jesus and all of his friends will say goodbye to goodbyes forever. We're going to be learning more about that when we head out to our kids' program in the hall. But before we go, will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he died and rose again. Thank you that if we trust in him, even though we die, we too will rise and live with you forever. Help us to trust in you. Amen. Parents, kids are just going to head out to the hall for their program and toddlers into the admin block for toddler time. in prayer before we uh, read from God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that it is so full of truth and that you reveal yourself through those words. We submit our hearts to you and pray that we would be yielded to what you say and become doers of your word and living, breathing examples of those truths. In Jesus' name, amen. As you can see, the first reading is 1 Corinthians 16, chapter 16, you'll find it on page 1155 of the Pew Bibles. Before I start, um, so it's, the last, it's just the last chapter in one of Paul's letters, and as such, it's got lots of unfamiliar names in it. There are, there are ones that um, have more unfamiliar names. And I'm reminded that a school teacher once told the people that um, because there are no sound recordings from 2,000 years ago, nobody actually really knows how these names, these words are pronounced. But I'm going to give it a go. So, about, so now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatians churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go to, through Macedonia, I'll come to you, for I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so you can help me on my journey wherever I go. 
for I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit, I have to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I'll stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because the great door for effective work has been opened to me and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with my the brothers. Now about my brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labours at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus and Achaicus arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send, greet, send you greetings. Achilla and Priscilla send greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. So we're going to learn a, a new song. It's a, a fairly simple song about Jesus' resurrection and the difference that that makes for our lives. Um, the verses are all, all the same except for the third verse, which is a little bit different. You'll just have to listen for it. It goes up towards the end because when we share in Jesus' resurrection, the, the fourth going higher for us. So this is how it goes. Thank you. 
again, the rock will succeed. Colossians chapter 3, 1 to 17 on page 1184 as you can see. Okay. So since then you've been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which belong, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another, each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another, and with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. And second reading, uh, Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14 on page 202. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be, you'll be blessed when you come in, and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. 
but they will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord, your God, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the works of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of these commandments I give you today, to the right or to the left, to follow other gods or fo and serve them. This is the word of the Lord. open back up to that reading from Colossians uh, and just sort of keep that open with you. We're going to be mainly looking at that this morning. If you're a teenager and using one of the sermon sheets and following along, your word for today is transformation or transform. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for calling us together as your church. We thank you that you love us, that you have bought us at a great price. We thank you that you gather us by your Spirit in your Son. So please, this morning, open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear from you, to hear you speak, and give us wills that long to obey you, lives that are in line with your good and perfect purposes. We ask this for the glory of your name. Amen. So today we are in the middle of our three-part mini-series, talking about the mission, the values and the vision for St Albans. So that means today that we are thinking about what God would have us value, what we should care about as a church. But before we get into that, I think it's really good for us to stop for a moment and think about the value that God places on us. We are his children. In 1 John chapter 3, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. It's nothing short of spectacular that the creator of the universe, the one who is enthroned outside of all of this, this universe in which we live, that that God should call us his children. If you are a Christian, you are one of God's holy people, God's chosen people, dearly loved. He's placed a value on you and me and on this church that is beyond imagining. It is the value of the life of his own son. A bit earlier in Colossians in chapter 2, it says this, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And he has raised us with Christ. And because we are raised, we are set free to be transformed into his likeness. Have a look at chapter 1, in the first, starting at the first verse. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. 
Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The great human problem is that without Christ, we are physically alive, but spiritually dead. Way back in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God made Adam alive in two ways. Physically, a, a spirit in union with a physical body, and spiritually, a spirit in union with God. Later on in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. But Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, disobeyed God and they ate the fruit. They didn't die physically straight away, but the process of dying began. They did die spiritually because their sin separated them from God. And from that time on, everyone born into this world is physically alive, but spiritually dead, separated from God. Before coming to Christ, we didn't have God's presence in our lives or any knowledge of his ways, so we tried to live independently of him. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Well, what does that mean to say that we are dead? We were dead. We weren't dead physically, but we were dead spiritually. We were separated from God. And Jesus came to remove that separation, to reconcile us back to God. Eternal life isn't something you get when you die. Every Christian is alive right now. One of the constant themes in the New Testament is the glorious truth that you are in Christ and Christ is in you right now. That means we have a new identity. We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the knowledge, renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Whatever way we might have identified or defined ourselves in the past no longer applies. If you think about it, most people identify themselves with things like their gender, their age, their nationality, uh, maybe their job. But Paul says that for a follower of Christ, none of these categories count for anything anymore. Because our identity is no longer determined by our ancestry, or by our social or economic status, or by our age, or by racial distinctions. Our identity is that we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And we are in Christ. Those old ways of identifying ourselves only have any currency in this earthly life. But who we are in Christ matters for eternity. In Christ we have forgiveness and transformation and the Holy Spirit living within us. We have a new nature and a new status as saints. Dearly loved children of the King of Kings and citizens already of heaven. It's not about where you came from. It's not about who you were. It's not about what you did or how you lived in the past. We are no longer defined by our past. We are a new creation because of Christ's work on the cross. But remember, when we were dead in our sins, we tried to live our lives independent of God. We let the world and what it values shape us. And determine our identity. And that's why Paul urges us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But of course, renewing our minds doesn't come naturally, there's no automatic kind of delete button that erases past programming. Renewing your mind happens when you consciously get to know the Word of God so that you can understand who you are from God's perspective. And that's why we value God's Word 
as our highest authority at St. Albans. It's essential for a Christian to have a true understanding of who God is, and it is also essential for a Christian to have a, a, a true understanding of who we are as his children. It's essential because we cannot go on behaving in a way that doesn't match up to who we are in Christ. Neil Anderson, in his book, Who I Am in Christ, says it is not what we do that determines who we are. It is who we are that determines what we do. And that's exactly what Paul was telling the Colossian church. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. What values should shape our church at St Albans? Well, they're there. Compassion and kindness. We help each other carry life's burdens. We love each other even when that's not easy. We seek to understand each other's story and all that's brought them to where they are now. And we don't do, just do this inside the church. We want compassion and kindness to spill out from here into the community. Humility. We put others and their well-being and their needs first. We follow Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve. Gentleness and patience. We try very hard to understand that each of us has come to where we are through different struggles and joys and sorrows. Some of us have been Christians for a long time and some of us are very new. Some of us have had the chance to learn a lot and some are only just beginning. So we look for every opportunity to build one another up. We think before we speak. And we offer love rather than judgment. And forgiveness. When we are hurt or offended, we don't hold on to it. We don't grumble to others about it. We forgive and we do all that we can to be reconciled. And over and around and holding all of these things together, we love. We love each other in the same way as Christ loves us, laying down his life for us. Something gloriously unique about the church is that we are not defined by race or by gender or by age or social status or even by past behaviour, but by the fact that we are united to God in Christ Jesus. Our identity comes from him. And so that's where our values have to come from. What makes this amazing transformation possible? Well, Paul says in verse 3, You died and your life is now hidden, held, kept safe in Christ. Now I want you to read that verse for yourself slowly. Verse 3. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Can you see the, the point that Paul's making there? You died, past tense. Who you were, how you lived, what you did and what you thought before you became a Christian is dead. It's finished with. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's the present tense. Now, you are already a new person with a new life. And the reason we gather together as a church for corporate worship is to praise God that he has done that for us. And to encourage each other to live out that amazing truth every day. This isn't just about a relationship between us and God. It's something we can experience in our daily lives. It's not just a nice thing to know. It's what all of our hope is built on. It is the only way to live by faith. 
in those first 10 verses of Colossians 3, uh, we get five statements about who a believer is in Christ. We have been raised with Christ, verse 1. We are hidden with Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of God, verses 1 and 3. Our old nature is dead. We have taken off our old self, verse 9. And verse 10, we have put on our new self. All of this is already true because we are in Christ. It's not about what we've done. It's not about what we need to do. It's about what Christ has already done for us. But the crazy thing is that we can get ourselves in all sorts of knots and beat ourselves up, desperately trying to become something God has already made us. To live as faithful and fruitful followers of Christ, we need to put our trust in what he's already done for us and then live our lives according to that. Live our lives according to that transformed reality. That new identity as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. God has brought us together as a church to help each other do that. Paul says that the members of a church need to work together as active participants in all of that. And those same first ten verses in Colossians 3 include some clear commands about what we must do now that we are in Christ. Firstly, we are to be people who set our hearts and minds on the things above. Hebrews chapter 12 puts it slightly differently. It talks about fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So this is not pie in the sky, you know, later on. This is Jesus, who is the truth now, who is the only one who is worth believing in. And at St Albans, we want to set our minds on the truth from above rather than the lies from the pit. Colossians 2.8 gives, 2, 2, gives this warning. See that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. The basic principles of this world are that truth is up for grabs. You can have your truth and I can have mine. That self-reliance, independence and getting as much as you can before the end are the chief objects of life. And that only those things which we can see and touch are real. But we know that the unseen world is far more real than the seen world. The things we see, the earthly things, are only temporary, but the unseen things, the things above, are eternal. Secondly, we are to be people who put to death the practices that belong to our old earthly nature. Verse 5, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. We want to leave behind the behaviour that characterised who we were before we were in Christ. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language and lying. We have been transformed from death to life. And now that we are dead to our old life and raised to real life with Christ, we need to put the things that belong to the old life to death. To put these things to death, is to take the power out of sin. But it's something we can't do in our own strength. We can only do it through Christ. We can only do it in His power. And at St Albans, we want to remind each other all the time about the power of Jesus to transform. The power of Jesus to give life. The other image that Paul uses for transformation, the transformation that Jesus makes possible is taking off old clothes and putting on new ones. Many of you will know what it's like when you come in from working in the garden with your clothes all kind of filthy and sweaty. You take them off, you jump under the shower, you wash away the dirt and maybe some of the weariness. And of course the last thing that you want to do is pick up those dirty clothes off the floor of the bathroom or out of the laundry basket and put them back on. Verse 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices 
and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul says that the church should be the place where we strip off the filthy clothing of sin that we used to wear. Where we get rid of it. And where we get dressed in the fresh new clothes of God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. It's not easy to throw out old clothes, though, for some of us. I've got a favourite shirt at home, maybe you have too, uh, that has been, you know, damaged. I spilled paint on this one. I can't wear it out anymore. But I don't want to get rid of it, so it's tucked away at the bottom of a drawer. It can be the same with sin. Paul says the only way to rid ourselves of all such things is to remember who we already are in Christ. Hidden, held, kept safe and secure in Him. And to set our hearts and our minds on things above. The things of His kingdom. And if we do that, and if we clothe ourselves with the ways of living and being that He treasures, we will see our stinking grubby old clothes for what they are and piece by piece to give us the power to throw them out for good. I've been praising God as I have been reading again through the responses that many of you made to the short survey we did earlier in the year, the question, what do you care about? And I'm excited because in Colossians 3, Paul paints a picture of the church we want to be. We want to be a church who help each other take off our old self and put on the new. Not harshly or with any sense of superiority, but with gentleness and patience. We want to be a church full of people who help each other experience what it is to be brought from death to life. To be clothed in the righteousness of Christ and the splendour of God's children. We want to be a church where the truth of God's word is supreme. Where the message of Christ dwells among us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and with gratitude in our hearts. We want to be a church where every visitor, every seeker, every searcher, every broken hurting soul experiences the welcoming love of Jesus where everyone sees the restoring and transforming power of God at work in his people and they want that for themselves And we want all of that because we want God to be glorified. Whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we want to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So let's do that. Our gracious and loving God, let all that we do, all that we say, all that we are as your people here at St Albans be to the glory of your great name. May it insult the Lord Jesus. May he be seen as good and beautiful and attractive and desirable. May the power that raised him from the dead be at work in us, transforming us. May the love and the compassion, the gentleness and kindness all of those things that have come to us because we are in Christ. May that spill out from here, may it flow out from here, so that this community, where you've placed us, can experience Jesus. And we ask this in his name.
Um, we're going to sing again. It's been a little while since we've sung this song, but it seems to me to be a good one for the series we're doing at the moment. It's a prayer that asks God to take his word and to put it in us and transform us by it. So please stand up and sing together. <laughs> together by saying the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God to the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God is not made. Of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For our sin and for our salvation, He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have chosen us as your people and made us your holy and dearly loved children in your Son. Enable us to clothe ourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Help us to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature and to put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Keep our minds and our hearts set on things above where we have been raised in Christ and of the day when we will appear with him in glory. Strengthen us for our work in the world empower your church to proclaim the gospel of salvation in service, word and sacrament. Heavenly Father, we pray in the wake of the attack upon the man at the soup kitchen last night. We are grieved and disturbed by this act of violence in the midst of a ministry which seeks to show forth your mercy, love and compassion. And it reminds us of how desperately our city needs the transforming grace of the Lord Jesus. We pray for the healing for the man in body and soul. We pray for the person who attacked him, that he would be brought to justice, but also to repentance and salvation. We pray for David, the other volunteers, and for all who were present. We thank you for their courage and quick thinking. thinking. We pray that you would uphold, comfort and heal them as they begin coming to terms with such a traumatic event. Father, you are the God who brings mercy, wholeness and salvation. Please protect, bless and provide for the soup kitchen, for all who serve in it and all who receive from it, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Most gracious God, ruler of the nations, we pray for those who serve in government, for the members of parliament and particularly our Prime Minister. Direct their work and influence their decisions to the advancement of your glory and the safety and welfare of this country. Heavenly Father, we pray for your worldwide Holy Church. Fill it with all truth and in all truth with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purge it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where anything is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen and confirm it. Where it is divided, heal it. And unite it in your love, grace and truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we begin to prepare for communion, let's remind ourselves of God's grace. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let's make a humble confession of our sins to the Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to Him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator and eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and who instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we, that we have received these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it, in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the new and everlasting covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come, let us take this holy sacrament, the body and blood of our Saviour Christ, and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Would you please make a circle around the room and could those who are helping me come forward, please. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for us, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and 
feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we heartily thank you that you graciously feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and assure us thereby of your favour and goodness towards us, and that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom, by the merits of the most precious death and passion of your dear Son. And we humbly beseech you, Heavenly Father, so to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and for ever. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're going to sing our final song together now. Uh, that will be an opportunity for those who give through the bag to do so, uh, and for all of us uh, to give thanks to God with a grateful heart. Let's go into this week praising God for what he's done for us in Jesus.
today is uh, the day of our annual meeting of parishioners, which will be happening in five minutes, technically. <laughs> uh, that will immediately follow the service. We're going to serve morning tea here in the church. Please stay, please don't go. I don't think it will go for too long. It would be great if you could all stay and be part of this. It's an important day in the life of our church each year. So your morning tea will be served in here. If you brought children with you, Charlotte has got a program, uh, or, well, some activity, maybe a program might sound a bit lavish, has got some activities for them to do outside uh, or in the hall, uh, so they, they can be looked after as well. And we should have you away from here by, by 12 o'clock, the Lord willing, just to see how we go. Um, so please do stay with that. But for now, let's pray for God's peace. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.